For Shalom TV's news update on this Friday, October 5th, I'm Mark Golub sitting in for Tisha Bader, who's on vacation. As the debate continues on how to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons, two major American figures have weighed in, and both seem to be warning against the U.S. bowing to Israeli pressure. In an exclusive interview with the Washington Post, former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger said that America should not publicly set red lines on the Iranian nuclear program and should not allow itself to be pushed into war by Israeli concerns. Kissinger is quoted as saying, we cannot subcontract the right to go to war. That is an American decision. Kissinger was careful to point out he is not saying that America should not have a red line in mind and in fact feels that a red line is necessary. But for Kissinger, such lines should be kept secret. So the decision on military action can be then decided in terms of what he calls tactical necessities. Kissinger explicitly cited Israel as one of the reasons for keeping the red line a secret, saying that publicly announcing red lines could be used by Israel as a justification for its going to war thus making the U.S. culpable in an Israeli decision. And in a similar story, the World Jewish Daily is featuring a Ynet report that Robert Gates, the former American Secretary of Defense, has issued a harsh warning that an attack by either the United States or by Israel cannot possibly succeed in obliterating Iran's nuclear program and would not only end in failure, but would make a nuclear-armed Iran inevitable. Gates, who was reportedly one of the most prominent opponents to such a strike during his tenure in both the Bush and Obama administrations, spoke to an audience in Virginia saying, the results of an American or Israeli military strike on Iran, in my view, would prove catastrophic, haunting us for generations in that part of the world. Instead of a military strike, Gates recommends that the U.S. pursue further sanctions and other diplomatic measures. Referring to Israel specifically, Gates also recommended reining in Israel's ability to act unilaterally should the U.S. choose not to exercise its military option. Gates contends that Israel should not have what Gates describes as a blank check to take action that could do harm to American vital interests. Well, in a story that's taken Israel by surprise, the municipal government of Paris, France, has signed an agreement of cooperation with the Palestinians of East Jerusalem in an attempt to send a political message of solidarity with the Palestinians and their aspirations for a future capital in the city. On its website, the Paris Council announced that it is the first French community to sign an agreement of cooperation with the Arab part of the Holy City. Paris has earmarked 300,000 euros for the cooperation agreement, which will support vocational training, entrepreneurship, culture, health, and social action, as well as institution building. Of course, from Israel's perspective, this agreement is a blow to Israel's claim that the eastern Jerusalem is part of its united capital. And a spokesman for Israel's foreign ministry responded by reminding the world that East Jerusalem does not exist as a separate entity and that the French council was, quote, living in a make-believe world. And staying with Europe, For all those who hoped that the lessons of the Holocaust would forever change the face of Europe, if not the world, it is both discouraging and in some way frightening to see how neo-Nazi groups are becoming ever more present on the European scene. The latest example has been highlighted by the Anti-Defamation League here in New York, which has condemned the inclusion of a Greek neo-Nazi party as part of the Council of Europe's Committee on Equality and Non-Discrimination. The openly anti-Semitic and racist group calls itself the Golden Dawn Party, and it denies the Holocaust and has inflicted violence on dark-skinned individuals in Greece. 
in statements reminiscent of the Nazi glorification of the Aryan race. The Golden Dawn Party argues that only men and women of Greek descent and consciousness should have full political rights. And recently they held a blood drive to collect blood which could only be used for ethnic Greeks. And speaking of the legacy of the Holocaust and the night virtually all of European Jewry endured during World War II, the New York Times reports that in Israel, a number of children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors are now choosing a very powerful way of never forgetting. These young people are having the numbers branded by the Nazis on their relatives' forearms tattooed on their own arms. One young Israeli, Eli Sager, 21 years old, has had the number 157622 tattooed on her arm, the same number her grandfather, Yosef Diamond, a survivor of Auschwitz, bears on his arm. Eli chose to be tattooed four years ago after a high school trip to Poland, explaining that all my generation knows nothing about the Holocaust. You talk with people and they think it's like the exodus from Egypt, ancient history. I decided to do it and remind my generation I want to tell them my grandfather's story and the Holocaust story. Ellie's mother and uncle recently followed her example and had the same numbers tattooed on their arms as well. There are some Israelis who are offended by the tattooing and in general voluntary tattooing is prohibited by Jewish law. However, for this group of Israelis, it's their way to never forget. And in Israeli politics, news is leaked out of intrigue and secret meetings as it was revealed that Defense Minister Ehud Barak met with former opposition leader Tsipi Livni in New York some two weeks ago, apparently at Livni's request. According to the report, observers see the meeting as an attempt by Barak to coordinate a political alliance with Livni, who'd vowed she was done with political life when she resigned as head of the Kadima party. The report of the Barack Livni meeting comes amid speculation that former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert may return to politics and try to form a block of parties that would include Kadima, Yair Lapid's Yesh Atid, and the new party that Livni and Chaim Ramon are in the process of forming. Turning our attention to our own community, one of the most serious concerns on the American Jewish scene is how to keep young Jews involved in Jewish life, especially after their bar or bat mitzvah ceremonies. The vast majority of Jewish teenagers tend to leave synagogue and active Jewish participation once their studies and preparation and actual ceremonies are over. And so Jewish organizations are always looking for ways to increase the level of Jewish teen engagement. With this goal in mind, the reform movement has announced an expansion of its national campaign for youth engagement with the help of nearly 200000 in grant monies from the Jim Joseph Foundation. Rabbi Rick Jacobs, the new president of the Union for Reform Judaism, hopes this youth engagement campaign will transform the current culture by creating new opportunities to engage youths in areas such as the arts, leadership development, and community service. The campaign specifically attempts to increase engagement of post B'nai Mitzvah teens from 20% to more than 50% by the end of the decade. And on the lighter side of the news, former NBA Most Valuable Player Allen Iverson who was a star for many years with the Philadelphia 76ers, will be back on the court, but in an Israeli uniform. The JTA reports that Iverson will play for Maccabi Haifa in its two exhibition games against the NBA Dallas Mavericks and Minnesota Timberwolves to be played later this month in the U.S. Iverson, who retired from the NBA earlier this year, after an illustrious career in which he led the NBA in scoring four times and was an all-star 11 times, was invited to play for Haifa by coach Brad Greenberg, who was part of the 76ers staff when Iverson was one of the most exciting guards in the league. 
And three cheers and mazal tov to Tel Aviv, nominated by the Wall Street Journal for City of the Year, alongside, where else, New York City and London, as well as another 22 major urban centers. In explaining why Tel Aviv won a nomination, the Wall Street Journal referred to the Jewish city's achievements in the fields of technology and research, and noted the construction of Tel Aviv's light rail system and its White City project, which has been honored by UNESCO as an example of modern architecture and town planning. And that's Shalom TV's news update for Friday, October 5th. For Shalom TV, I'm Mark Golub. Have a lovely Columbus Day weekend. I'll be back at this desk on Tuesday for Tisha Bader. Till then, Chag Sameach for Simchat Torah. Be well, my friends.